Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Let's stand together. We want to lift our hearts, we want to lift our voices to the Lord today. We want to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. And so let's just focus on him as we do that.
scripture reading this morning is Psalm 67. And I want us to um, pray this and keep our eyes open. Just read along and, and say it along together. But let's pray.
pray this enthusiastically. Let's pray this together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen.
Father, we praise you and we thank you for you're so good to us. Pray that you would help us, Lord, that those words would not just be songs, but that they would be prayers from our heart, that you would be our vision. Pray that you help us through the remainder of this sermon, this service as we go into the sermon, Lord. Pray that you would be glorified through all that we do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed to go to your class. Everyone else, go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say for the ladies, Friday night at Julie Cudney's house, we're having a movie night. So please come join us um, in the bulletin that comes out in the e-newsletter. There is um, Julie's address and phone number if you have any questions um, or just find Julie. Raise your hand in case anyone doesn't know who you are. What's that? July 30th, this Friday. Next Friday. <laughs> I was going to show up at Julie's house Friday night for a movie. Might still. Um, next Friday, July 30th, please join us at Julie Cudney's house. Um, movie starts at 8.30 because we're going to do it outside, big screen. Um, but come whenever. Enjoy some fellowship beforehand. Um, so don't mess it up like I did. And then just a quick little announcement. I think for those of you that might be new here and have um, little ones that you're still taking care of, or maybe you're not new here but have just forgotten because we haven't been in the building so long, there is a mom's room, like right as you enter the children's hallway. Please feel free to use it. I think it's just been like closed and dark for the past few months that we've been back. But um, it's up and running, and you can hear the sermon in there as well, just in case. You were right about that. Okay, thanks. See you in a couple weeks. Men, this Wednesday at Hoffwoods Park is the last of the hexathlon. We've been playing lots of different sports together. I'm not supposed to make this announcement, but I'm going to make it because I see some faces in here that haven't been. So Hoffwoods Park at 7 Come, I think this week is uh, soccer, which I have no talent at, so feel free to come if you have no talent at it. Um, as you may have noticed, uh, we've had some roof issues in the past year. Um, I'm long-winded, so I wrote this out. Uh, we've had some roof issues in the past year, or years, depending on how you define an issue. Uh, when you move into a, a house, you take on the joys of home ownership. Uh, that's what we're experiencing right now at Cornerstone in this building. As a result, you probably shouldn't leave the, house, the roof of your house leaking, which leads to more costs, and so we are taking steps to remedy the leaky roof that you've seen buckets around for. <laughs> um, just like owning a house, the why you're doing something is important. Uh, with your house, you move in, you want a place to call home, a place to invest in the neighborhood, a place to create and build community. Um, you don't just need a place to eat and sleep. If that's all you're doing, then doing repairs to your house would be something that's a money pit, or at least a lot more frustrating than it are, already is. When we bought this church, the vision was to invest in this neighborhood, to firmly plant in Westerville so we could have a place that we call home locationally, and a place that we could make an impact for the kingdom of God. We wanted to pro proclaim the gospel, to serve the community, and to practice and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just as the Bible says, whatever you do, do for the glory of God, we want to use this building for the glory of God. That means maintaining it so that when people walk in, they can feel physically loved by God. That may be hindered by holding a bucket to catch rainwater like last week as Tony was preaching. Um, I used to live in Rome, and I love that St. Peter's Square, if you've ever seen where the Vatican is, St. Peter's Square is that... Is that, that plaza in front of it that has the columns all coming around it. The architect of that um, designed it 
with the heart that people that were walking in there would feel like the arms of God were wrapping around them. Now, whether he succeeded or not, I don't, I don't know. That's up to you. Um, but I love the intentionality in this. Now, we didn't design or build this building. Um, if we had, that, there's some things that I'm sure would be different. Um, but as we pay money to repair the roof, to improve the inside, fix drywall, ceiling, things like that, um, as we are the body in our being the body in this building, uh, we hope and pray that people will feel the arms of God wrapping around them. That's a really long-winded way of saying that we're paying a company a lot of money to fix the roof. Um, it's taking a big chunk out of our savings. Um, but I want to assure you that we were prudent. We got four or five estimates. Uh, different companies, I was on the roof more times than I want to be, both in rainstorms and not in rainstorms. Uh, we got a sample analysis to make sure that we weren't just wasting money. Um, and so they did samples of all the different areas of the roof to tell us, hey, here's the expected life expectancy. Um, we're getting a repair job that has a 15-year warranty, and we are thankful for the funds to be able to do this. I know there's a lot of ways to give. Um, there are a lot of missionaries we're supporting, organizations that are doing awesome things. Um, giving to fund a building probably feels really impersonal. Um, but we are praying that God will use this building in this place, in the city of Westerville, to be a place of gospel proclamation that goes forth in the city of Westerville, the city of Columbus, and beyond to hear, see, and feel the love of Christ. Um, so feel free to approach any of the elders or elder candidates uh, with questions, if you have questions on specifics of this. Um, but we did send out the first deposit to get that done. So that should be in the next six weeks, I think, is the time frame. Um, attached to that is, you've probably noticed if you've been in the room with the lovely wine-colored carpet in there, um, that there's holes in the ceiling and things like that. And we're going to get that fixed. Um, but as we do that, we want that room to be very intentional towards the um, loving people as they come into this building. Um, so I know the kids of Cornerstone have been lobbying really hard to put up wrestling ropes and make it like a WWF wrestling match in there. Um, we're not going to go that route. But we would love your input um, as, you know, we, we've had things like a coffee bar thrown out or a lounge or, or, or just different ways that people can come in and feel welcomed and loved. And I don't have skills with designing spaces. Um, but if that is your forte, I know over the years we've had different people come forward with, with ideas. We would love those ideas right now, because as we're fixing the roof in that, that's a great time to say, okay, we're actually going to make this a more appealing, inviting space. Um, so please approach me afterwards. Kurt uh, is heading up the hospitality ministry. Kurt, Ravi. So um, this being a hospitality thing, Kurt is going to kind of help facilitate that meeting, but we really want people's input, um, and we want your manpower when it comes to actually fixing things. Uh, so if that's something that you have a passion for, please, 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 please come and approach me afterwards, or you can shoot me an email. It's christopher.rule at gmail.com. Very simple. Um, shoot me an email or approach me, and we'll, we'll organize a meeting and, and start things moving in that direction. Thanks so much. Chris, you really dated yourself with the WWF instead of WWE. <laughs> there, good job. If you are here and you're always hot, I can assure you that front row right there, the fullness of the AC is blowing on that spot. So if I'm jogging around at the beginning of the sermon, I'm freezing from being over there. So if you, if you need a cool seat, I mean, you can go now. I don't mind. It is very cool right there. So, All right. This morning we are looking at Matthew 18. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35. As we've seen in this chapter, a theme here is humility. Humility. Not thinking too highly of yourself. Counting others 
more significant than yourself. That quality of humility is certainly highlighted in this text today as Jesus addresses forgiveness. When my grandmother was dying, she wanted to make things right with those she had hurt or offended. And so she literally asked that they would come to her bedside or if that wasn't possible, then she called every single one of them and asked for forgiveness. It's one of the most Christian things I've ever witnessed in my entire life. We all need forgiveness. We long for it. But what do we do when we're on the other side? What do we do when we are the ones in charge of forgiveness? That's what Jesus addresses in the text today. So go ahead and stand and follow along. I'm going to be reading verses 21 through 35 in chapter 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We praise you for the gift that it is to us. We ask you for your help today, Lord. You have said, this is the one on whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. So help us today, Lord. Help us to know that you are. Help us to believe that you have spoken. And help us to embrace your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Now, verse 21, Peter comes and says to Jesus, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. It was common in that day that rabbis would teach people to forgive up to three times a brother who sinned repeatedly against you. So Peter might be thinking that he's really going above and beyond here. He's really going an extra mile to say seven times. And let's be honest, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, if we're honest, that's a lot. That feels like a lot when we're the one who's being sinned against repeatedly. There comes a point where we don't believe the offender anymore. There comes a point where in our flesh, someone comes to us for the sixth time asking forgiveness 
for the same thing, and we're starting to feel like, I don't know if you mean this or not. It's understandable that Peter would ask this question coming off of what Jesus has just taught about confronting a brother or sister who has sinned against you. How many times do I bother with this? How many times do I have to forgive them? And Jesus responds and says, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. 77 times. Now let's just, before we get to the story he gives to illustrate the point, let's, let's know here that Jesus is not saying that we keep a tally marking off each and every time and finally when we get to 77 with some people that may happen sooner with some people it may happen later but when we get to that magical 77th tally we can throw up a peace sign to them and walk away and have nothing more to do with them that's not the point here he's making a much more significant point in the text he's saying forgiveness is boundless and forgiveness is Christian. And so he illustrates that for us. Beginning with verse 23. Therefore, in light of that, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. Now, these first words are very important here. The kingdom of heaven, the reign of Christ, Jesus' reign over us. So that's involving you and me if we are in Christ. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So from the very start, we ought to be thinking, okay, this is a story about me. This is a story about us. A king is settling accounts with his servants. He's working out the debts of all of his subjects in all of his kingdom. Verse 24, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, none of us probably are like, oh, 10,000 talents. What does that mean? What is 10,000 talents? talents. Well, it's incredible, okay? This is an unthinkable amount of money. A talent was the highest monetary standard. It was worth approximately 20 years wages for a laborer. So let's think through that. If you take just minimum wage and multiply that by 40 hours a week, then multiply that by 52 weeks in a year, then multiply that by 20 years, you get $366,080. That's a lot. But that's one talent. And Jesus says this man owed 10,000 talents, so the equivalent of over $3.6 billion. Okay? Now, anytime you hear this text or you read the text, you're like, oh, wow, that is 10,000 talents. I would love to have 10,000 talents. That's what's going to go through your mind from now on. Those hearing this would have just simply thought an impossibly large debt. It's like a child saying a gazillion, bazillion dollars. It's just a monumental amount unimaginable debt and this man is brought to Jesus who owes or is brought to the king who owes this much Jesus says verse 25 and since he could not pay his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Now, let's be honest. This is justice, right? 
He had acquired all of this debt, had obviously committed to repay it, but there's no way. Imagine someone calling you this week and saying to you over the phone, hey, your bill's due, you have to pay $3.6 billion. You can't imagine that, right? You'd be devastated. And you'd have to say, I, I can't pay. I don't have it. I don't have the money. And that's the case here. And so the king says that he must be sold, him and his family and everything he owns, to pay the debt. Verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. This man is desperate. He has nothing that he can do, nothing he can offer other than his life. He throws himself before the king, at the mercy of the king, begging, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. Now, is he sincere when he says that? I don't know. I mean, how in the world is he going to pay what uh, amounts to $3.6 billion, right? But he's broken, and he's desperate. He could never repay that debt, ever. In verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. That's incredible. It's incredible. If it's difficult to believe the amount of debt the servant owed to the king, it's even more difficult that this king would do such a thing as this. It's compassion. The king feels compassion, has mercy on this servant. Out of pity for him, he forgave the entire debt. Your debt is canceled. You're free. Go in peace. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture. It's where we hope the story ends. But it doesn't end there. Verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. How does the servant respond? Not as we would expect, right? Not how we would hope that he would respond. He goes and finds a fellow servant who owed him money. Now, a denarii was worth one day's wages. So this fellow servant owed him 100 days' wages. So if we use the same math we used for the first account that's about $7,000. Now, is that significant? That's significant, right? No one wants to get a call this week and you say, hey, you owe $7,000. But it doesn't compare to what this man has just been forgiven. And that's the point of what Jesus is saying here. And his response to such lavish mercy and grace is to find this Man and begin to choke him and say to him, pay me what you owe. It's really, it's honestly unthinkable. And so, verse 29, his fellow servants, his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. At no point does it trigger in this guy's mind this sounds familiar <laughs> this sounds really familiar like from a few moments ago when I said and did the same exact thing it doesn't click 
This man falls down at his feet, and we immediately see what is in the first servant's heart. He's pleading with him, please have patience with me, I'll repay you. This man had just done the same thing, but how does he respond in verse 30? He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. His heart has not changed. He doesn't learn from and reflect on the compassion of his king. And he puts the man in prison. Notice what it says, until he should pay the debt. Now you might wonder, how is he to earn money to pay the debt if he's been put in prison? And the answer is he cannot. His family will have to pay it while he is suffering in prison. Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. They go to the king and tell him, this is what has happened. His peers know that this is wickedness. They know how he had been forgiven and now see the way he treats this man who owed him so much less. It says they were distressed. That word means both grieved and also indignant. And they go and report it to the king. We can imagine how the king responds here. In verses 32 and 33, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? This king is understandably angry. How, how could he? How could he possibly respond to this kind of mercy with this kind of wickedness? He calls him a wicked servant because he is. He has acted wickedly in response to compassion, grace, and mercy. In verses 34 and 35, And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The reality is this servant would never be able to pay it back. The cost was too great. What could he do to earn that amount to pay back his king? And so he will forever suffer because of his arrogance and abuse of grace. And Jesus says, that's what my Father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. That's an incredible illustration that Jesus gives us here. David Platt writes concerning this illustration, the Bible is not saying that it's easy to forgive or that it's natural to forgive. However, it is Christian to forgive. That is the truth. To forgive is a Christian thing to do. Now, I titled the sermon this week, Don't Forget to Give. And I didn't title it that simply as a statement reminding you and reminding myself, hey, you got to forgive, so don't forget. you got to forgive. But more as a this is the only possible way to forgive. Don't forget the gospel to enable you to forgive those who sin against you. It's when we don't remember and reflect on the gospel and reflect the values of the gospel that we are unwilling and unable to forgive. This man forgot the grace that was shown to him, forgot the mercy that was shown to him, forgot the compassion, or at minimum, just didn't care. 
is not living in light of the compassion and mercy and grace that has been lavished on him. And Jesus is saying, look, this is you. Remember, this is his response to Peter with Peter's question of how often do I or should I forgive someone who sins against me? And Jesus is saying, don't be like this servant. Why? Because your debt was unimaginable. As great as a $3.6 billion debt sounds, your debt of sin before a holy God makes that look small. It was a debt that meant you would justly be sent to prison to pay for your sins, but you could never do it. I could never pay for the sins that I've committed against God. I could never pay that. What could I do? What, what could you and I ever do to impress God, to pay him back in some significant way to where he would say, it is enough. You are righteous enough in your own strength. How could we ever do that? We could never. Our debt is too great. And there are some who when the king came to them to settle accounts, fell before the king, Jesus, pleading for mercy. And do you know what he says? He says, you're pardoned. He says, your debt is canceled. He says, you're free. But there's a cost to that. There's a cost to that. In Matthew 18, there was a $3.6 billion cost. There was a cost, right? We, we, we have to acknowledge that. It's not just the king saying, hey, you're free. You're forgiven. Do you know what that cost the king? $3.6 billion. That act of mercy cost something. He's not getting that money back. There's a cost to his forgiveness. There's a cost to his mercy. The king bore the cost of this act. And as it relates to our debt of sin, there was a cost. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside by nailing it to the cross. What cross? The cross that Jesus suffered and died on so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. That cost. And the question is, how will we respond to that kind of grace? A grace that looks on me and all of my sinfulness and all of the things that I've ever done and in all of the things that I will ever do and says, you're forgiven, you're pardoned, you're clean. Go in peace. How will we respond to that kind of grace? When someone sins against us and repents, do we forgive? Will we forgive? One time? Seven times? Seventy-seven times? Is there a threshold to our compassion in light of all that we have been given in Christ and forgiven because of Christ? The kingdom of heaven, it's us. 
may be compared to this king. Those are Jesus' words. So I'd ask you, is there anyone you are harboring bitterness toward? Who, if you could, you would choke them and have them thrown into prison. Is there someone you need to forgive? It's the same as the man in the text. Forgiven so much, how do we respond to that? If we're to reflect Jesus to this world, it will never be through bitterness. It will be through love and forgiveness. Each week we take the bread and the cup to remember. And we remember so that we will hopefully live in light of the truth of the gospel. That we will hopefully live in the light of what Jesus has done for us. Our sin was great. Unimaginably great. And Jesus' body was broken so that ours would not be. Jesus' blood was poured out so that it would be said of us, you're forgiven, your debt is canceled, go live in peace, you're free. As we are dismissed by Rose and come forward to get the bread and the cup, you go back to your seats, we'll take it together there. But let's remember, let's think and remember as we hold the bread and the cup, of what Christ has done, what he's accomplished, so that it can be said of us, your debt is canceled. And let's pray that we respond in a way that lives in the light of that kind of grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Goodness that cannot be measured. Kindness that cannot be measured. Mercy grace. Pray that you'd help us, Lord. Help us to be a people who genuinely live in light of your grace, with joy, joy that true forgiveness brings, and mercy, mercy that has experienced what it is like to be in debt. To never, ever be able to repay it. Mercy that flows from a king. We praise you and we thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Holy, set apart in all of your ways. Father, you are unapproachable. You dwell in unapproachable light, your word says to us. And yet, you made a way through Christ that we could come clean. So help us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, as Tony paints the, uh, the picture of the debt in the passage that we studied today, it, it's interesting that we remember the body of Christ with a cracker and juice. The debt is so substantial for the people of God when you consider that $3.6 billion is nothing compared to uh, just how much God has wiped away for us. So let's pray as we remember the body and blood of Christ, and we'll take this together. Jesus, we just first want to bless you and thank you. God, we remember, even with this small symbol, we remember that your sacrifice, your death, what you paid for us to be forgiven, it can't even be like equated. It can't even be something that we put numbers to. Your holiness is infinite, God. You have so much. You are so contrary and so different than us. You are so set apart. And just the chasm that existed between us and you because of our sin, Lord, you overcame it all. But it cost you something great. And we thank you. We thank you that you are willing to pay that price. So we take this small cracker, just remembering the broken body of Christ and just what that cost our Savior. Let's take the bread. And now, Lord, we want to take this cup, just remembering the blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sin. Let's take the cup. Now, Christ, help us to remember. Help us to remember the cost, Lord. We want to be a people that reflect you. God, your character of forgiveness, your willingness to forgive. It's an incredible example for us, Lord. But Lord, we are a forgetful people. We forget so quickly, and we don't want to be that. And so we pray, Spirit of the Lord, just help our minds to remember the truth of the gospel. Sin will take place. Sin will be committed against us. So help us to be ready. Help us to be quick and eager, Lord, to practice the forgiveness of our Savior. We bless you, Lord, and please be with us during the course of this week. Help us, God, to walk faithfully and humbly with you. Help us to have our eyes open to look for opportunities to proclaim your truth to the world that you have us in. And please, God, lead us for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week. You are dismissed.